speak out, unmute your mic one by one, just so we can hear. Uh, some of you, we can't see your, your cameras. Uh, we have uh, Fred Dickey. Here. Mayra Hernandez. Mayra Hernandez. Cesar Garay. Uh, here. Chairman John Villarreal. Here. Arturo Dominguez. Here. Alma Acevedo. Present. Rafael Duenas. Here. Julian Radnowski. Here. Joe Maldonado. Present. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. John, your, your video is on mute. I think he's on mute. I'll try that again. Declo's on mute also. Maybe they're talking to each other without us. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I'm working on my lip reading. <laughs> Can y'all hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. okay. The next item is for the approval of the, of the minutes. Uh, there's uh, two minutes. There's one from May 7th and run from June 4th. Uh, I know we got an amendment just uh, this morning on the May 7th uh, minutes. And, and thanks for bringing that to our attention, John, uh, on making and having and making those corrections. Uh, but we did get, get those out late. Um, one thing I want to explain about the minutes for uh, the main meeting was we had a really difficult, uh, uh, or June rather, uh, really difficult problem with audio. Uh, so we put our notes together and that's the best we came up with. Um, if there's something you feel that needs to be mentioned in there, uh, I'll be glad to take that via email from you um, uh, anytime after this meeting. Um, so just, just let me know. Again, our apologies for that. No problem. Have has everybody had a chance to review the minutes? Yes, I have not. I just got in from out of town. I yes, but Let's start first with the. I'm sorry. Who, I'm sorry. Who was uh, a junior? Oh, something to say. You you can continue. Let, let me hear what you have to say. No, no, go ahead, Julian. Well, no, I was going to say the minutes, uh, I hate to ask this question, but are the minutes supposed to be a transcript or are they just supposed to be a summary of the conversation? Um, they're supposed to be a summary of the conversation. Um, we we do, um, and as best we can, um, and maybe June was an exception, but we try to record other meetings. Uh, and 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 so that's why we're not doing tr uh, complete transcripts. The reason I so I'm not saying that it should be a complete transcript, but so I guess I don't know how to phrase this, but I I looked at the minutes and the grammar is just so far off. I I wasn't sure if I had to grade it and. I, no, no. We, we, I don't want to prove it. It's just really it no, needs to be fixed. I think I think if you go back and look at that, um, uh, Mr. Villarreal brought up the same concerns. Uh, uh -huh. We went through it twice. Uh, once again uh, this morning, um, and uh, hopefully uh, the way it reads now, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better. Um, and, did it get sent uh, out again? We sent it out again. Uh, what time, Arnold? Did you send that out? It was just now, Julian. It wasn't um, early this morning or anything. About 11 o'clock, Julian. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I'm I sorry have. about that. 11, 11. 11, 11. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then again, to reiterate my point about June, um, um, you know, we had to kind of do shorthand for that because of the audio situation. Understood. Okay, John, you can continue. On what you were saying. Okay, uh, we'll start first with the May 7th uh, minutes. 
Uh, I don't know if y'all had a chance to go through the amended minutes. Uh, and if y'all did, do I hear a motion for the approval of the minutes or any changes, proposed changes? The, motion to the, minutes? To the minutes of May 7th and June 4th, 2020. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes of May 7th and June 4th for 2020. Second. So I have Mr. Duenas that uh, made the motion and the second came from? Arturo. Second. Arturo. All those in favor, please raise your hand and or say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, next item on the agenda. Hey, Mr. Chairman, real quick, uh, just to interrupt, uh, I think uh, uh, I saw that Maida was on the call now. Maida? Uh, I'm here present. Sorry, Mike. I was working on my computer, on my camera, but now it's working. Okay, good. Yeah, we see you. We see you with that big smile. So that's great. Yes. She's been marked present, Mr. Chairman. And the next one we have is actually citizen comments. Um, I did not receive any official citizen comments via our uh, online form, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so as of this moment, we do not have any citizen comments. Very good. Thank you, uh, Arnold. Uh, as it's time here, uh, next item on the agenda is the CARES Act information. There's a report only, uh, Mr. Garcia. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so on this on this particular item, I want to go through through it fairly quickly um, in the interest of time. Um, uh, if you have any questions, uh, make make them brief. I'll try to answer them. If not. Um, perhaps that, uh, you know, offline, you can send me the questions or call me. I'll be trying to answer those. But for the interest of the meeting, let me just say that the CARES Act <clears throat> sent, um, uh, or the rate was able to receive about um, $15 million for the CARES Act funding. And uh, that was based on a formula that the federal government uh, created. City. <clears throat> Cities below 500,000 were, were to receive $55 per capita based on their population. So we received for like 14.9 something um, a million dollars. So that's why I just said 15. Um, cities above, cities and counties above 500,000, they got $176 per person. And so, um, you know, if if we were able to get that, we would have received forty five million dollars. Um, but instead, we received fifteen. Uh, additionally, uh, smaller cities like us, Corpus Christi, Amarillo, Lubbock, Beaumont, places like that, um, there's a lot more uh, hoops that you have to jump through to get your money. Um, in the bigger cities, their entire pot was put into their bank account, and they said, "Okay, follow the rules, and you can spend your money." For us, they gave us 20% upfront and said, you can spend this money, they're your 20%, and you're, you're, you do self-accountability. The next 80% of your money, you're going to have to turn in receipts, uh, and we'll reimburse you, and that's how you get your money. So that's a real hassle, um, and we're dealing with that right now. Um, all the money has to be used for, for everything, even programs. Um, by December 31st. So for instance, I got you one second. Uh, so um, so even money that we put toward workforce development, um, the courses that, um, that uh, people are eligible to take for retraining, they have to even, they have to end by December 31st. We simply just can't pay for them up front and they would last until next year. Everything has to be done by December 31st. So those are some of the rules that we have to deal with and, and receiving this money, we have to develop uh, memorandums of understanding with Laredo College, with Texas Workforce, uh, with Live Fund. Uh, we we uh, have to watch all our purchases. They have to be for public, you know, um, health. Uh, the, that's the other thing, just real quick, and I'll get to your question, Rafael, is 75% uh, of the money, can, uh, funds can be used uh, toward um, the, the public um, emergency, right, the pandemic. Uh, in all sorts of ways, but it has to be focused on that. Um, and then 25% uh, can be, if you wanted to, be used on economic assistance. So the city council 
um, said, no, we're going to use 25% on economic assistance. So we, we've developed a program with them uh, based on their request. Um, that's generally the rules of, 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 of the, uh, the CARES Act. And we've developed um, a $700,000 program with Laredo College for workforce retraining, uh, $200,000 with uh, Texas Workforce or Workforce Solutions of South Texas, and then the rest of the funds, to like two million two hundred thirty-seven thousand, are going to go to grants to small businesses, not loans, as was reported earlier. Um, ends up that we can't do loans uh, with some of that money, so we're doing just grants. Um, so that's the short end of it. If uh, Rafa, you had a question. Uh, thank you, Diclo, for, for yes, sir. work in this. Um, just a question, this CARES Act for the city is different than the one that was given to the Webb County? Uh, yes, correct. Um, unfortunately for Webb County, they did not receive very much money. Um, I think they got like $37,000. $35,000. Yeah. So, uh, yes, it is different. Uh, Tech, well, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so the funds that have to be used, um, for other purposes um, pertaining to health. Mm -hmm. um, is there any plan for those funds to be used to buy masks and possibly provided for free like San Antonio did to businesses? Yeah, good question. Um, we um, we are buying as as much, uh, is it PPE, right? That's the <laughs> acronym, PPE yeah. uh, as possible. Uh, one thing, uh, the one of the few ex exceptions are using up the money uh, and anything that you do with it by December 30th or 31st is that you can buy um, extra PPE and store it and not use it by December 31st. So we've even, um, I, Arnold, I think we bought a couple of like temporary storage buildings to buy as much PPE as possible and just put it away. Um, I don't think the city management yet has directed um, exactly uh, how they would distribute that in terms of, um, you know, would it be free to the public or we're going to give it to the health department or, or how, what, how they're going to do uh, a distribution with all the PPE. But, but that, that is the idea is to get it to the public. Uh, Teclo, uh, as far as the, what, two point some million dollars in grants, Who's going to be administering that? I know, and I forgot the name of the company. They were they wanted to charge like uh, what about two ten percent of of the of the amount of the grant? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, good question, John. Um, so Lift Fund is going to do. Um, that's the name of the company, Lift Fund. They, they're a their their speciality is micro lending, and so for for they're a nonprofit based in San Antonio. They have an office here in Laredo. Uh, and they usually do uh, uh, loans of like twenty-five thousand and below uh, to uh, to business owners and 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 self proprietors who are challenged on the financial side and would normally uh, not be able to qualify for a loan at a commercial establishment like 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 an IBC or BBVA or whatever. Uh, that's what they would do normally. Um, San Antonio, Bear County, Corpus Christi, McAllen, and, and El Paso have contracted them out to do their grant and loan programs, um, you know, d during COVID. And so we reached out to them and they were ha very happy to work with us. There was some initial confusion on, on whether we were gonna do loans or grants. Um, we were gonna try to do a 50-50 split on this CARES Act funding. Ends up that because if you did a loan with the CARES Act money, that means that money is actually gonna be working past December 31st. We can't do loans with that money. So it has to be grants. And to your point about the administrative fee, we did bring them down to eight percent um, on the on the fee uh, instead of ten, and that's a better rate than um, San Antonio and McAllen um, got on that, and and it's about the same as El Paso uh, got. So that goes to the administrative and and uh, and other things that they have to do uh, to uh, administer this program. What are the qualifications for the grants? Um, well, there's about six or seven primary qualifications. Um, and we, we tried to aim this program to uh, focus on very small businesses. So we're suggesting that uh, folks have 20 or less employees. Um, 
that the max loan that you can get is $20,000 um, and uh, that your your revenues were, would be below $1 million. Um, so several several triggers of that nature to uh, to keep the um, um, uh, the larger businesses from applying. For instance, we also said if you received a PPP loan, that you wouldn't be able to get this loan. So so you wouldn't be able to double dip. So we're we're trying to make it to where small businesses in Laredo um, can get it. Unfortunately, like I said, because of the formula. Uh, we're only we only have two million plus, you know, to to do this. Um, San Antonio, I think, put seventy one million dollars into this uh, program. Uh, we're only going to be able to help about two hundred businesses max. Um, and uh, you know, just to give you an idea, there's thirty thousand businesses in Laredo. So I mean, it's it's really small. It won't be small to the person who gets it, but it is a small n number of businesses that are going to get help. Um, do we know when this is possibly going to finally go out? Um, is there what's going to be that outreach approach of I, I'm assuming it's going to be this lift fund that does everything. But do we have a time timing? Yeah, well, we 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 were shooting and I think this is going to change a little bit, but we were shooting for July 26 as a rollout for it. But I think in order to do a better job on the outreach, we might have to push back, back push that forward a week. Um, uh, because we really want to make sure that, uh, well, we can't ensure that everyone hears about it, but we'll try our best to, to do more uh, social media uh, work, uh, traditional media, um, and word of mouth, and you know whatever else we can to get the word out to folks who to so they can apply for this um, loan. Um, I, in, in talking to some of the banks, um, uh, and John was with me on some of these conversations. Uh, you know the triple piece. Uh, you know, they didn't run out of money. They ended up with billions, hundreds of billions of dollars left because people just stopped applying. We hope that's not the case here. We hope that people will apply for this um, and not leave that money there. What types of advertising do they plan on doing? Do you know, or um, yeah, we're going to we're we're going to do um, the best we can on um, you know uh, a multifaceted approach. We're going to use social media, especially because people tend to do this on their phone. And you can apply for these grants on the phone, uh, or you can walk into the office. But we're going to do you know newspapers, radio, Spanish language, um, and social media in English and Spanish. Um, just in the interest of time, um, like I said, y'all can y'all can ask me questions later. But it's already twelve twenty, and we need to give uh, Ms. Frank uh, twenty minutes at least, um, which uh, we know that she's super good on keeping uh, time. Uh, we can um, uh, you know move on to that if y'all don't mind, Mr. Chairman. I mean, it's your call. Sure. Uh, any other questions, or should we move on? Okay, next item on the agenda is the overview of the strategy of using clusters for economic development from, and this is from Viviana Frank, of Able Cities. Viviana? Can I, uh, Viviana, before you start, and I just mentioned this uh, to you, and, and Julian reminded me of this uh, not too long ago, was uh, that uh, when, when the city council asked us to put together uh, some sort of strategy uh, uh, you know, for economic development moving out of the COVID situation, and we didn't know we were going to be stuck into COVID as we are now. But uh, we we uh, we talked about a lot of things, and one of the things that was really impressive was was uh, Viviana uh, really bringing the uh, the topic of clusters to the forefront. And uh, and I really appreciate her doing that. And we had uh, many long conversations about it. Um, and so um, I think it's something that we all know a little bit about. But she's she's been really good at explaining it. So. I was glad to uh, have Julian suggest that she come on board today. So, Viviana, uh, it's all yours. Can you unmute? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Nice to see everybody again. Uh, my name is Viviana Frank, and I'm a co founder of Able City, along with Frank Rotnowski, Mario, and Diana Pena. And we're an architecture and urban planning, urban uh, studies and civic engagement, economic development firm. 
So what we're, what, in the interest of time, I'm going to go as quickly as possible through these. It's a, it's, it's not um, uh, complex or complicated, but it does take some explanation. And I'm going to try uh, to leave some time for questions. Um, I asked Olivia to, to join me on, on this presentation because she, she and I worked together on the Economic Recovery Task Force that uh, Beklo has just mentioned. And we worked uh, on putting uh, this information together for the task force. So we're going to go over what is it? Can I control here? So we're going to go over what an industry cluster analysis is and why it's such an essential tool for economic development strategies uh, for any city. Okay. Yeah. So a little bit of a history. This comes out of the Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness out of Harvard. It is a methodology that has been adopted at the federal level through the Department of Commerce. Um, methodologies for economic development have come out through this and strategies and frameworks of, of how to develop economic development in cities based on competitiveness. Uh, Harvard and, and this institute are at the forefront of this. They've been working with governments around the world, including the United States, and many, many cities across the United States to help develop programs um, for economic development that uh, align with this methodology because it is the best way to retain, attract, expand, and innovate within your economic clusters. So real quickly, um, can you take that? Yeah, I think, I think you can see it. Okay, no, no, go back. So uh, the traded, uh, they divide economic clusters between they, Harvard, and EDA. Uh, who, who, through the Department of Commerce, EDA is part of the Department of Commerce. They have worked on defining clusters in the United States based on them being traded or local clusters. This is right out of the cluster mapping tool. You can go to it at, and, and really um, you can dive into Laredo and the whole area uh, around Laredo and get a lot of great data and information. So um, traded clusters are those that serve markets in other regions. They uh, afford specific competitive advantages. I mean, the best one, the best example, of course, is the transportation and logistics industry here in Laredo. And, um, uh, it, you know, there are many examples of that here in Laredo. And then local clusters, of course, are all the local economies and what they're based on there. There, it's healthcare, it's schools, it's all, it's uh, the drugstores. There are many, many examples of local clusters. You can dive into all the different types of clusters on the site and really kind of look at what, what each industry and all the different kinds of companies are related to that industry. So federal and state dollars uh, flow to reinforce and expand economic clusters. I am telling you that um, monies, grants, programs that flow out of EDA uh, are based on the methodology of economic development clusters and cluster analysis. Uh, it flows down to the state and the state, you could go on their website, put, put Texas industry concentrations, or Texas economic clusters, and you will see what comes out. And there are different, different uh, websites that will begin to tell you, including the economic development website of the state, that will begin to tell you um, how the state is, or is, is organizing its efforts, time, money around the state's clusters. So um, here's, this is right out of 
those websites from the state. So this is how our state views Laredo's economics clusters. We haven't really been involved in this narrative. They are gathering this data. Um, but I can tell you when the economic cluster analysis for the state was done back in 2005, if you look at the map, if you look at the map, uh, do I have a pointer? Yes. Right here, do you see my pointer? Can they hear me? Yeah, yeah they, they, they yeah, We can see the pointer. Okay, yeah. so, um, all right. So in 2005, Laredo wasn't even on the map, not even mentioned. This was uh, a mere 15 years ago. We know we had a huge economic engine here 15 years ago, not even mentioned. So in later, later iterations of their uh, economic development uh, plan for the state, they recognized uh, this, this area in red as freight and transportation arrangement. That's what they call this cluster over here. And then food and beverage processing, they've recognized Laredo as an up and coming place for that. Uh, so interestingly enough, we have, you know, a lot of rail going through here but they are saying we do not have support services for rail here. It's not showing up. I don't know if that's the case. If they say it's all in Houston and in these other areas over here, but I would bet that we do have support services for rail. So um, this is where we can begin to develop the narrative based on the data that we have that will inform the state and the federal government on our economic clusters. So um, they have us as process distribution and logistics consulting. Big red here, you know that. So is that the next one? Yes. Okay, so just uh, real quick, alignments are necessary. They're not important, they're absolutely necessary. So the federal and state uh, economic development methodology is based on regional industry clusters because they form the building blocks of U.S. economic competitiveness. All those studies that were done at the federal level, this is why they do it. So then also, of course, uh, federal and state grant funding and financing is based on how local economies reinforce and expand their economic clusters. And then obviously our local economic development programs need to align with the state and federal economic development methodology. And Olivia, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know if you wanna jump in uh, at any time. Uh, sure, uh, okay. no. like, like Viviana is saying, one of the necessary reasons that we need to look at clusters uh, is to put Laredo on the map. And that has been one of our biggest challenges as long as it, as many years as I have, have been working economic development. Um, and it doesn't matter how many presentations you give people at the state or federal level. You have to have the, the deep dive into data for it to really make its way into these reports. And that's something that we have been lacking. Um, economic clustering, uh, you know, the reason why it makes its way into policy decisions is because it's a concentration of businesses. Uh, and this has to do more with the traded clusters that Viana mentioned. It's a, it's a concentration of competencies and industries that not only impact the local economy, but it has an impact outside of our region. And that's why it becomes really important to the state and federal governments. Um, this does influence how much money we can get uh, for our infrastructure. It Now it becomes a focus, the industries become a focus of how can we improve the, the efficiencies of that industry? And that becomes a target, not only for the local economic development folks, 
for our city, our county, but also for the state. So these kinds of, of, of information, studies, data becomes really essential, as Viviana just mentioned. And there's different types of, of cluster strategies. Um, I can tell you we've tried employing some of them already. It becomes very difficult because it, it, it entails a lot of public and private cooperation. And sometimes that has been a challenge in our, in our city. Uh, but again, no matter what kind of, of uh, economic development strategy with clustering you use, the main things and the main reasons to do it is because they all will increase the, the competitiveness of our industry. It will make that industry much more efficient. Um, it does uh, create wealth. Uh, and then it does allow us to target our, our marketing strategies and our economic development strategies in, in greater efficiencies. Um, it's easier said than done, but that's the real basis and the reason you know, why we're interested in this type of, of data. Anyone there? <laughs> we're not we're not sleeping on your presentation, trust me. No, we're all here. We're just on we're on mute. <laughs> What's that? Uh, hey, um, you bring up some really good points. Um, uh, on 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 the way that clustering can be used as a strategy um, and identifying you know what your cluster is going to be and how to use it, but you mentioned something really, too? Yeah. and I'm really cognizant of that is mm -hmm. is how you market yourself. You know, being in what cluster you have. If you look around the state, nice. Austin has a tech cluster. Dallas has insurance and finance as a cluster. You know, and and so on, and 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 all those are marketed very well. Well, maybe to to make it uh, bring it home a little better is to, to give an example. Um, you know, clusters can also take the form of, of a. Uh, of, of Let me see that. Mm -hmm. You are sharing. Can you hear me? Yeah, Viviana, y'all have y'all's mic on still. Okay, great. Y'all got it now. Good. Okay, so for for the transportation industry, which is Laredo's probably strongest cluster, along with government, uh, you know, this is where TxDOT focuses their their studies and can come in with monies for infrastructure can come in with, with now if you're looking at government monies for the port um, that can increase those efficiencies. And now we can come in and market uh, those efficiencies so that when other logistics and transportation companies uh, are, are looking at different sites, now we become more competitive because we have more to offer. Um, you know, through the port, if we have a highly efficient port of entry, well, now we become more competitive if we're looking at the produce of growing our produce and, and creating that as a, as a cluster in, in agri uh, uh, food industry. So now we can go to Canada and say, hey, why are you going through the valley? You know, we've got a highly efficient port and more di uh, direct uh, you know, entry through Laredo. So it creates this, this much stronger uh, competitive marketing approach that we can use. Um, but it can also apply to an industry that needs uh -huh. to grow, for example, manufacturing. We can't say that, you know, we have a, a, a small concentration of manufacturing in the region, which is in Nuevo Laredo. The problem is that we don't have the supply chain industry to support that in Laredo. And so how do we 
focus on growing that supply chain that will now support our uh, 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 manufacturing development. Um, and we can use this kind of approach to look at what are the deficiencies that are hindering us from creating that or growing that cluster uh, of manufacturing that we want. What are we lacking? What's us from being competitive. Sorry, I talked too much. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to jump in because I want to uh, get to the frameworks for cluster studies here. Uh, it's a good moment to do that and move on with uh, this presentation. So uh, got about seven minutes. That's why I wanted to get through. All right. So um, just a quick overview of what determines competitiveness. This is a very easy way of understanding how to start to look at the city of Laredo. Endowments at the bottom here means that you look at, you know, what we have. One great example uh, that created our transportation and logistics cluster is the fact that we're an international border. That's an endowment. That's not something we created. It was created when the, when, in, in 1848. So that, that helped create the necessity to have a port and to have all the industries that are part of that port. There's other endowments. Uh, a lot of people have mentioned our, our culture, our history, our, our uh, architectural resources. There's all sorts of different endowments that we need to dive into and really kind of uh, look at what they are. A lot of it has already been done in the comprehensive plan that was done for the city in 2017 and was adopted. Along with that plan was the economic development strategies for Laredo, which was a separate document and part of that initiative. So a lot of those endowments were defined in there. Then you look at your, your policies, your microeconomic policies, and then your development and political institutions, and you see what you need to do to reinforce what, what, what you already have and how to, in your, in, in your economy and how to develop it further. And then of course, the uh, microeconomic competitiveness, which is having to do with looking around and seeing the quality of the national business and uh, environment. There's a little thing called a location quotient, which we won't dive into here, but it tells you where you compete in an industry in your area, um, the state of your cluster development, and the sophistication of your infrastructure, your operations, and, and the strategy that you develop. Most importantly is this uh, little graphic here. It's called the diamond model. That's used extensively in analysis of your industries, of, of, of uh, your whatever, in, whatever firm you're looking at, whether it be a, a governmental uh, institution or a uh, local industry. And there's, and there's other frameworks, but they are specific to the industry themselves. So um, this is from, uh, Michael Porter is the person who heads the Institute and he is the economist that has really uh, 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 developed the economic development uh, methodologies that have informed the programs uh, around the world and across, certainly across the United States and how to do economic development. And this is his diamond model on how government influences uh, cluster upgrading um, from his book in 2000, this is 20 years old and it's still used today a lot. Um, I can, and you know, we'll be, we'll sit and talk if y'all want me to come to some kind of committee meeting or whatever it is that you all want me to do to further explain this, we will. This is just a quick overview. 
So, for instance, I read the Chapter 380 uh, draft that was sent, and I saw that there is a desire to do uh, to a preference to send resources towards the tourism industry in Laredo. So building and upgrading clusters, this was a, a little study that was done for the uh, Carnes tourism cluster in Australia. You can see that it's a great example because you can see internally the hotels, the restaurants, the airlines, everything that makes up that cluster and then the supporting services and, and all the different types of companies that would be as uh, in, in each one of these categories of orange. So your industry dive would be to look at the food suppliers that are there, the property services, look at all the restaurants. It's really to understand, it's not just to say travel agents, but to understand what kind of travel agents are there, what kind of tour operators are there. So you begin to build this model out and you start to see the linkages and potential growth areas in your industry. So this would be an important exercise to do if you're planning to spend money to develop the tourism industry that is here in Laredo. It's hard to say that right now during COVID, but we know that there's, I don't know, 125 buses that come through here every day with people. You know, that's just one. There used to be a lot more, but when Laredo was going and blowing, but uh, it's definitely a, a cluster to look into and to develop in Laredo. So I just wanted to show you real quickly, because you don't have to read this, but the diamond model is in the middle and you start to ask whatever, this is the trans, Olivia and I, and I worked on this. This is the transportation and the logistics cluster analysis that we just kind of started to put the questions down that we would ask in the civic engagement process of people in this industry. And we would go around and we would begin to answer these questions. I don't, don't even try and read them right now, but I can, I, we can get you copies of this so that you can see. Um, this is a, just a, a little diagram of, because what you want to do in your in industry clusters is you want to retain, attract and expand within those clusters, but very importantly, you also want to identify potential linkages across clusters because that's where innovation begins to happen. When you begin to recognize that there's a way to, to overlap uh, business within, it, within your, and these, this is what these little ovals are. We have a distribution, e-commerce, transportation and logistics, hospitality and tourism, and local health services. And if you begin a discussion, you can, okay, you can begin to see how it's possible to link, okay, is there, is our local health services, which are our hospitals and, and um, our, our medicine, our specialized medicine and all of that, how do they, do they help people? Is there, if there's accidents in the, in, in the transportation and the logistic industry, do we support in the health industry, the kind of health services that will really uh, help that transportation industry continue to go and blow and perhaps expand that health service to, to make it a, a, an actual place where people come and say, well, you know, this is, the, this is the place that we need to go to get, to get the best knowledge and data about how to deal with these kinds of sicknesses or, or accidents that are something that happens to, to somebody within each one of these industries. And that's just one conversation that you can have that you can begin to have a discussion about how do these industries link? Because it's, it's organic. And you yeah, yeah. There's, there's even stuff like medical tourism, where you're mixing medical with, with tourism, right? I mean, there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, so, uh, uh, unfortunately, Olivia, I mean, uh, uh, Viviana, we have to leave it there, um, just in the, 
Well, in the interest of time here because of we've got uh, some more things on the agenda. We're going to try to finish up um, here around one, probably ish now. Um, so um, this is very exciting to me. I like it. Um, I, in fact, you know, I, I, I think about it almost every day as, as we're, you know, doing business development uh, and recruitment or expansions within. Um, and so, and we still have a lot to learn, but it it is a, a labor intensive project at the beginning, but I think one well worthwhile to get into. So I appreciate you coming by um, today and, and thanks Julian for bringing this, uh, you know, up uh, you know, as something that we should do. And, and maybe we can come back and have another meeting. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, some more about it, but I'm um, sorry, we have to, we have to stop it right there, Viviana. Uh, Viviana, is there anything important that you'd like to add uh, that to, to leave, you know? To... Well, just I left this last slide up. Um, a cluster initiative is an organized civic engagement effort. We can it's it, it, it's definitely collaborative amongst uh, groups of companies, the public sector, and other related institutions uh, with the objective to improve the competitive uh, of, of any specific regional cluster. It's, it, you know, and there's, there's several in an area or just one in an area, but you do it uh, as a civic engagement process for each. And um, it, 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 I think it's a process that uh, can start rather relatively easily because it's a civic engagement effort, but it needs to get buy-in from the, from the city, the county, the school districts, uh, which is the academic sector and the private sector, all the companies and the stakeholders that are involved in each of these regional clusters. We're, we'll close. I know Alma Aceveda uh, has a couple of questions. So go ahead, Alma, and we can move on to the next item. It might just cut into everything, but no, I'm, and I know, um, Viviana, uh, you had shared a lot of information for me with me on the task force and Olivia, don't say sorry. Um, we could nerd out on this all day, every day, <laughs> probably still not to the dent in the amount of information, but uh, I'm trying to understand, you know, at first I was thinking, well, maybe it's like a SWOT analysis. And then I pulled out the SWOT analysis from the, the Viva plan and I'm like, well, it's not quite that, but is this, you know, is the idea that you're kind of throwing out there that the clusters exist, this is what clusters are now, is this something that we need to gather the information and report it like in the way that the census uh, yes, let me just say that. Well, let me go. Let me go forward. Let me. This is you, we have to apply the diamond model, and the diamond model is. And I don't have the slide up on here that explains this under all of this. But I can sit down with you all and talk to you about it more in depth at another time. Okay. Uh, it's not a. It's it, this. It's not a SWOT analysis, although components of SWOT are in it. Uh, I just want to add, it's a, a much deeper dive than a SWOT analysis. Yeah. Um, but in the end, you're trying to identify the needs of the, the businesses uh, and so that you can create a much more competitive industry. Um, you know, it, it just goes a little deeper than your normal SWOT. Viviana, could you, in the comment section, uh, leave your information for any further questions that any committee members may have either right now or at a future, uh, for future reference and just keep this dialogue with you in partnership in, in creating all of this. Thank you for the presentation. Sure. And what did they want me to uh, just thought you can touch that. Great idea, Rafael. Uh, yeah, just leave us all your, your contact points, uh, Viviana. I just want to add, as, as the, what, what did you call me, Tetu? The, the member of the general public. Yeah, member of the general public now. <laughs> that uh, I'll be happy to to serve on, on any of, uh, you know, any committee that comes in. That would help us. That would all help right. us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll go on to the next item of the discussion. Impossible action on the first draft of the 380 agreement guidelines. Those were sent to you. So go ahead, Teclo. Okay. Um, so um, 
uh, I'll, I'll save you the the trouble of reading every every word in this document. Uh, and um, but I sent this out um, uh, unfinished uh, as a draft because I, I was hoping that um, you, you guys could look at it. And even if you haven't uh, by today, um, you know we're not probably not going to make any decisions on it since since the document is not finished. Uh, is to just give me some feedback if you think it's going in the right direction. Uh, if you see something that you don't like or you really like or you want to make a suggestion, uh, just email it to me. I'd be glad to put it on the next agenda uh, or you can bring it yourself, you know, to the next agenda. Um, I'm, I'm open to this. Julian and 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 Chairman Virial, um, I think it was Joey, uh, uh, made, uh, had, did some preliminary work on this uh, on their own and they did their own research. Uh, you know, they fed me a bunch of, of things to, to include. And I'm not um, finished with that yet. So I want to thank them for their work on, on this. Unfortunately, um, you know, we've been on on um, overdrive with CARE, CARES Act, and obviously the COVID situation locally, where, um, you know, we're, we're basically almost sometimes some days, that's all we do uh, all day long from uh, from start to finish is handling COVID uh, uh, situations. And uh, we're, we're pulling people from different departments to help out here and there. And, and uh, I think we're beginning to do some furloughs as well for some non-essential personnel. So um, I apologize for not you know having this finished, but there's there's reasons for that. Uh, but, but we'll get through it and, and it'll be a document that you're proud of at the, at the end of the day. And so, um, so work on a question I have is, um, are you available, and I guess this goes out to John and everyone else that's part of the subcommittee, um, does everyone have time to meet next week regarding the Chapter 380? Because I, I, I do know that we formed a subcommittee early on. Um, I'm, I'm free next week, uh, and I think we should continue that subcommittee. I'm not sure if John or anyone else has opinion regarding that i'm free most oh. of next week is joe okay or joey sorry teclo you can call me what you want joe joey <laughs> it all works okay uh mr chairman are you would you be available sometime next week maybe we can coordinate a, a time with julian and, and and joe friday would be good for me uh monday to thursday uh, i can't okay i think i might be good next friday uh i'll email y'all uh, okay uh, friday works for me also okay Great. The important is for us to look at the, the actual 380 guidelines we have from the other cities and and uh, try and select what's good for ours. And, and this is based on that and, and based on, on some of what y'all gave me, uh, looking at Fort Worth and Corpus and, and El Paso and San Antonio and so forth. Uh, I think Rafa had something. Yeah, for the rest of the committee members, I suggest that um, you read the, read the 380 that they have already developed thoroughly for now. And then any pointers that you have, I already, I already jotted a couple down. Um, send them to the subcommittee, well, to the yes, whole subcommittee, so that they can look at it. So send it before that they have a meeting so we can know when you guys are going to meet, the subcommittee is going to meet so we can send our amendments, our pointers, and just our revising of the 380. That would be great. Anything else on the 380? Julian, do you have anything? Um, no, just the only things I'd like to kind of get in there so we can get at least possibly as a formal motion is the inclusion of the Chapter 3 or 380 ordinance. Um, specifically to the economic clusters, I'd really like to inject that. Um, so once we have that finalized document. So if, if everyone's okay with it, I'd like to motion that the chapter 380 agreement uh, should reference the comprehensive plan, which it already does, um, but I'd like to just formally motion that. Um, the comprehensive plan and economic development strategies for Laredo. Also to direct funding in chapter 380 ordinance towards the development of Laredo's economic clusters once we have those done. Second. Who seconded that? Arturo. Okay. 
So I hear a motion. There's a second. For all those in favor? Is it open for discussion now? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, sorry, yes, discussion. I, I don't feel comfortable voting on a motion to put something when I haven't reviewed the document yet. And I don't have my head fully wrapped around um, the clusters and what kind of money it takes to develop the clusters. And in just in the chat, we were mentioning looking into grant, possible grant money for EDA to develop the clusters. So to formally motion to put money towards developing clusters, I just, I think that's a little bit premature, especially when we're just talking about you guys as a subcommittee meeting next week. I feel that if you're meeting as a subcommittee and you want to put that writing, that in writing as part of the document to be reviewed and finalized, I think that would be a better approach. I don't know if anybody else wants to discuss as well. Any discussion on what Ms. Acevedo mentioned? Um, I just like to clarify, I don't think I specifically stated that funds would be directed in any direction. It's just a, well, at least for the committee, the committee can continuously, when we meet next week, we know what we're really focusing on. Um, that's all I really have to say, but I'd like to hear from everyone else. So you're voting to do what again? Julian? Sure. Would you like me to reread it? Yes, Julian, reread it, please. Please. Uh, here, I, I wrote it down while I was saying it. Chapter 380 agreement should reference the comprehensive. So the motion is that the Chapter 380 agreement should reference the comprehensive plan and the economic development strategies for Laredo. Also to direct funding in chapter 380 ordinance towards the development of Laredo's economic cluster. So when I say funding, I'm not referring funding to develop economic clusters. I'm saying that chapter 380 should focus funding. So when it comes to writing those agreements um, to economic clusters that we identify. So it's not, does that kind of clarify that? Um, I, don't know. I think uh, if I can help here, um, I think what, what his motion is once we establish what those economic clusters are, and let's just say, for instance, one of them is healthcare, that mm -hmm. we use the 380 um, and any sort of in economic incentives programs to uh, to uh, focus on that particular cluster. Correct? Yes, that is correct. That's what I'm trying to um, make clear in my motion. Okay. And, and if some of you still don't feel comfortable with it, um, Julian, uh, perhaps you can hold on to that thought and maybe after we, after we meet, we can bring it back. Um, I mean, I, I, mean, I think it's fairly positive, but that's, I don't want to influence anybody in any sort of way, um, you know, on that. Yeah, personally, I think, I think uh, Julian, your, your heart and your thoughts are in the right place. I think the, the timing is, is maybe a little bit off. I, I kind of, uh, agree with with what Alma is saying uh, just because we we have to develop this and I think that's something that you could bring up to the subcommittee at the moment rather than the actual um, make it an official motion for or back and keep it up more as an open discussion within the subcommittee for now that's just a simple opinion on, on my part I agree with uh, Rafa and Alma I think we should wait send it to subcommittee and then review well, well, if that's the case, um, we, we, I mean, uh, Mr. Chairman, you want to call for the vote again, and then maybe we can offer a possible solution to that. Yeah, I guess, uh, Julian, do you want us to vote or do you want us just to wait on the resolution? I I don't mind waiting on the resolution. The, Like I said, the, the point is not to direct funds, I, like Alma stated, to economic, like, funds to create economic clusters. It's it's just the guidance. My, my train of thought is to have the guidance ready so when the subcommittee meets, we know what we're going to achieve versus right now, the current chapter 380 doesn't state really what we're gonna go after. So that that's my mindset. I don't mind waiting um, and having a subcommittee meeting on the whole thing. I, but it's whatever everyone feels more comfortable with. 
Uh, well, I think we ought to we ought to wait, but but I think we we are going to be focusing on that, Julian, on the on clusters, yeah. and and, and, uh, and get it a little bit more concrete. Uh, I don't know if you still want us to go through the resolution or, or just uh, just wait. He can resend the motion, or um, or we can go ahead and do the vote, and then and then take it up, you know, at, at another time. You, you you cut it out. Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Um, I said you can rescind the motion to, to put that up for a vote, or we can go ahead and, and take the vote, and then you can bring it back uh, as as a different item later. I'll just rescind the motion. Okay, Julian. Julian, if I may, it's Joey. Um, maybe if you have something written down that we can all look at. I feel like there's maybe some grammatical stuff that we're all either understanding or misunderstanding or whatever it is. So that might help. Um, in what you know getting across what you want what you're trying to do does that make sense yeah yeah i think that there's just a misunderstanding on what my motion was and it's creating a lot of confusion um we can work through that later in the subcommittee okay i agree sounds like a good deal okay any other discussion on the 380 agreement Okay, we'll move on. We'll move on to the our last item on the agenda is discussion and possible action on recruitment of new national business to Laredo. Okay, um, so um, there is uh, right now. Um, let me just say that there's probably about uh, five things on on my desk that we're dabbling in that are really early, um, and um, I'd rather not discuss them in a public you know, atmosphere um, at this point, but there's one that that might be okay to do that. Um, and, 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 uh, but I would still ask y'all and I don't know if anybody from the, you know, from the public is plugged in or not, but that's okay if they are, uh, they have every right to listen in on this meeting um, is um, uh, the, the USL is, uh, is a soccer league and they are right underneath the uh, the uh, the MLS Major League Soccer, and the USL has about 55, 56 teams across the country. They've been around for for many decades. They're an established league. They have vice presidents and and business development professionals and PR people and social media gurus. I mean, it's not some fly by night organization. And um, and in um, of their teams, they they have uh, in the Teams that you might know, they have in El, they have in El Paso, San Antonio, uh, the Valley has a team, and most of them have stadiums that seat about anywhere from seven thousand to fifteen thousand people. Uh, uh, El Paso led the league in attendance last year for for USL soccer. They um, they reached out to us and they said we want to be in Laredo, and uh, and they want to put a franchise here. There's a $2 million franchise fee, uh, Rafa, if you were thinking of uh, buying one of these franchises for, for the USL, you can go ahead and do that right now. Uh, but they're not asking, they're not asking the city uh, to uh, buy a franchise. They have a, they, their business development people will, will uh, identify a, a possible franchise owner. Uh, it doesn't have to be from Laredo, although they'd like for the person to be from Laredo, but they'd look at Texas first. And so um, they're doing that right now. Um, they're asking us um, uh, to, um, um, if we commit um, to them using um, Unitrade uh, Stadium as, as where they would play. You, we can put a soccer field inside. Uh, the design is, was made for that. So you can put a soccer field inside Unitrade Stadium. Um, the El Paso team, as I mentioned, that led the league in attendance, um, they play in El Paso's baseball stadium. So it can be done um, in lieu of building a new stadium, uh, which can get very costly, even a, even a small one. Um, but uh, but so they, they've approached us. We've had um, three discussions with them already. Um, they, they want to um, come to Laredo, but obviously because of the COVID situation, they haven't uh, been able to do that, but we continue to talk. Um, we're in the process of giving them measurements in the field and and uh, 
And uh, they, their goal is, um, they said every city above 500,000 people, in, um, or is it 300,000, I think, in, in, um, in the United States, um, has a soccer team already. So they're looking at the cities under 500,000 and below that don't have a soccer team, either an MLS or, or a USL one, and they're identifying that market and they want to go in there. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Ruffa. Yeah, I just wanted to add on that, uh, that the USL is – is a growing um, soccer league. It is uh, has been creating a lot of momentum to the point where teams within the MLS are opening up teams in the USL league. So it's something that's grabbing a lot of momentum. I know RGB has the the Toros, which had the exact same uniform as uh, the Houston Dynamo. Completely different cities, but same same franchise. So they're they're basically brothers and sisters in case they're they're looking at us as, as an investment in case the USL were to grow even greater than than the MLS within these all smaller cities. Is that a is that a big, a go ahead uh, go ahead Fred? Is that like a farm? Are they like a farm club for the MLS now? They can be. Uh, some teams have agreements, like Rafa said. Uh, the Valley team has an agreement with with Houston, right? And so, the, so they're connected. Some teams do not uh, have agreements with MLS uh, directly, but um, the the level of play of these leagues, uh, you know, I, I brought this up to some people already in Laredo. They said, "Oh, great, we've got some good high school players. These players are much better than high school level. Uh, they're collegiate <laughs> and above, and they get paid, right? This is professional soccer. One good thing that they're doing so far is they've reached out to the Laredo Heat to see how they could be involved." Um, they're, they're very well aware that, you know, that, you know, they have a decent, maybe, but small following in Laredo. Um, and they, they, maybe they might be interested in joining the, the ownership group of this new team. So I don't know the, what's happened with those conversations, but I do know they've already had them. Um, uh, and, and, uh, they, they did talk to me about the academies that they want to come in on a ground level, even before they, they hit the field, they want to start their soccer academies here. Uh, the USL has really strong soccer academies. And in fact, the one that uh, Rafa mentioned in the Valley in McAllen, they've created a, 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 a like a soccer high school um, for, for these kids. So they're like on soccer 24 uh, seven and it, and the high school is located right next to the stadium. So then, you know, as soon as they, you know, get out of school, they go to the practice fields and then they, they, they do some like U 17 and U 15 tournaments at the stadium. So, I mean, I'm liking what I'm hearing so far. When our very first meeting, they, they already had a lot of uh, Laredo's uh, marketing information down. Like they knew our population, our demographics. Uh, they knew all these things. And one of the ways that that they they're, they're that they're successful is in reaching out to to an ownership group. Um, they come in the, the the league comes to the city and does all the research, right? They, and they'll know how much our market will pay for a beer. They'll know how many uh, people normally attend a game at, at a time, right? Uh, what's you know what's the best time for a game? You know who's going to show up to the to the to the ballpark, right? They'll have all this. So when an ownership group lays down the two million, they give them the notebook and go here. Here's what you need to know. You don't need to go do the research on on how much concessions are cost or how much you should try. You should charge for parking or anything of that nature. So they give them that book and then they go buy it. And, and that's part of their, their franchise fee. Um, right now, like I said, we're not being asked to do very much, which we, we love. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll probably we hope to be able to rent the stadium to them for a certain fee. And uh, they have about 22, 23 home dates in their uh, in their season. Uh, someone had a question. Yeah, uh, I have a question. So, like the Tecolotes, do did they have like a a, a franchise fee? A uh, what what arrangement did did they have with the league? Uh, is there anything we're going to do maybe with Novo Laredo? Does Novo Laredo already have a soccer team in, in the Mexican league, or maybe in one of the farm Mexican leagues? The um the the Tecos are part of the uh, the Mexican uh, you know baseball league um, and uh, I um I don't know what their agreement um, you know what kind of agreements they have around the around the country the in in Mexico usually every team has a, the way well, I used to cover the Mexican league back in the day when I was a sports reporter and uh, each you know each city has an owner of the 
of their team and they can they can move their franchise wherever they like. Uh, the league is not very strong in, in, in the Mexican League baseball. Usually the, the team owner can do what, what they want. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the, our, this, our, our contracts with, uh, with the Tecos is, is simply for stadium use. Um, they, they, they want to be in Laredo because it expands their market, their market reach. They can you know, sell more tickets and merchandise and so forth if they play in both places. So, uh, and we, we don't mind them at all using our stadium. Obviously that's why we built it. So, um, we, we lease them the stadium and I guess there's, con there's contracts with concessions and all that kind of thing. Um, but that's the extent of our, our relationship with, with the Tecos and with the USL will be similar. One thing they did ask me, um, <clears throat> on, uh, the USL is they said, Hey, is your stadium near hotels and restaurants? or any sort of entertainment district. That's very important to us. And uh, obviously it is. And, um, and we even have a water park that's under, you know, design right now to go right next to the stadium. So they're super happy about that. Um, and should they be able, should this be able to happen? Uh, they're, they're really liking the location. Question. Uh, so I mean, $2 million investment. I mean, what type of average attendance would they want to have, or I guess, revenue because you would have the, the sky boxes. Uh, I mean, it seems like a pretty, pretty difficult uh, number to get. Well, I mean, that's, that's their business. I mean, we, we don't know it. And to be honest with you, I'm glad we don't have that concern because we don't have to fill the seats and, and pay for it. I mean, this is a private enterprise, uh, you know, and, and we'll let them uh, figure that out. Um, you know their their payroll is probably pretty low, is my guess. To be uh, to be honest with you, um, I don't know what um, you know what our contract, is, our stadium contract is going to be with them if it comes to to play. Um, but they have ways to make money. Like I said, they've been around for several decades, and they have uh, more or close to sixty teams now. Um, so I think they've got it down, John. I just don't know the particulars. Yeah, Alma has a question. Um, I guess in the equation of the city being able to rent the Unitrade Stadium, who would be handling the tearing up and regrassing of the field? And, and is that the city has to be involved with talking to the Tecos in regards to the Tecos being okay because the potential of the quality of their baseball field being yeah. surfaced for soccer? Is that something like the city has to take care of? as part of their, the owner of the unit trade or do the city cover the subcontract to a maintenance crew, right? There's a, there's just like the match, right? There's a third party involved with managing the stadium, correct? That yeah. The city's board? yeah. So, um, the our, artificial turf. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, yes, correct. So, um, our parks, um, department handles, uh, you know, the lead on leases, um, you know, with, with who that, you know, who the party is and our, obviously the city manager, the city manager would get the okay, um, would we get the final okay on on the leasing of a stadium, uh, 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 you know, in a deal like this, right? Um, but uh, so I think Arturo just said that the what they did last summer was they turned the field from natural grass to uh, artificial turf. Um, it looks beautiful. So um, one of the one of the concerns that they won't have um, is figuring out how to do that, like you just said. Uh, you know, how's it going to work over, over a baseball field? So all they have to do really do now is just remove the, uh, the pitcher's mound and then put artificial turf where there's, um, where there might be dirt and that's it. And then when it's over, they'll put the mound back on and, uh, and put the bases back on and re reline it and they're good. That, that is a good, really good question. I'll tell you why it's because the, the seasons will, uh, overlap each other. So they're going to have to figure that out. Now with 23 home dates, you know, that's not many home dates over like a five month period or four month period. So there shouldn't be too many conflicts, um, but it might come up. But uh, the, 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 the turf uh, was marked for soccer field. So it should be pretty easy now to do that. It, yeah, it it that are, are those among the expenses that the city has to consider in this, the maintenance of the field and, and is there, right, there's, like I said, there's a third party that manages the stadium and the cassette concessions and everything, and that's administered by the city above them, or how does that work? Mm -hmm. 
as far as I know, on the on the concessions and 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 the con uh, and that contract, it is separate. I don't have too much knowledge of it, so I'm sorry I can't answer your questions on that. But in terms of the field, that is a, the, an expense the city would have to take on, and probably our maintenance uh, parks maintenance folks would do the switching out, and we would write that into the contract to make sure that we get paid for doing that. Yeah, one of the issues I do see on there is that there's so many contracts out there at, at Unitary Stadium with with tech calls and concessions and, and, and so on and so forth. So both season running concurrently, I just it's it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough one. Is all I can say. Is all I can say. Yeah, yeah, it is. Like I said, hopefully those. I guess their season runs like uh, through April through September or something like that. Hopefully, 22 dates over that five month period won't be that tough to handle. If they were doing like like decos, like a game every day, you know, or four at a time, then that would be a real problem. You're you're exactly right. Very good. Is there any other discussion? I know in the essence of time, we're already getting close to 120. Um, Mr. Chairman, what I'd like to tell the committee is that I'd like to bring this back to them um, uh, when it's a little bit uh, more developed. So then, so then the EDAC committee can make a make a make a recommendation to the council before we take it to the council. But um, obviously, through your questions, there's a lot of things that are still unanswered, and we just have to progress on that. Maybe, maybe in a two months, um, especially since that team can't travel, bring their officials here. You know, we can we can maybe make a recommendation to the council. It just depends on how the negotiations go forward. But uh, but I'd like for the EDAC to to do that, and I'd like to bring it back to them. Is it possible to get more information? I, I just don't know what we're recommending on since we don't know what they're asking for and the cost of the city, um, especially during these times of COVID. Well, that, that, yeah, that, exactly right, uh, Julian. That's why I don't want to ask you to make a make recommend right, make a recommendation right now. Let's. let's oh, wait. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought <laughs> okay. I'm like I I don't know. Okay. I understand that. No, we'll, 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 we'll bring it back in a, in a month or two, okay. and and then and then at that point, hopefully, you'll have enough information to, to make a decision. Yeah, I mean, and the the other thing is, I mean, and that's why we're bringing up the numbers. We don't want to bring somebody and just sort of like the last hockey team, and then it just falls at the middle of the middle of the season. I mean, you, you're doing two million dollar investment. I mean, you need to have the numbers to show that that it can work. So. Oh, oh, just to be clear, we're not investing two million. No, I, I understand that, but but the investor is investing two million, and of course, yeah. we're going to we rely. The city relies on, on on him paying him paying the city, right? And we yeah. just want to be sure that it's a viable project. I mean, for them that they will leave at uh, 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 in the middle of the season, like the last hockey team did. No, well, well uh, I want to be really clear with this, uh, and you bring up a good point, Mr. Chairman. This isn't a fly-by-night league. Um, you know, they have a lot of uh, history, and they have their, you know, their research people and finance folks and all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening. Hey, they might come to you and hit you up for that loan, man, for two million. Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> I'll just add, um, Anything else? Do they need general counsel? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just want to give some comments. Uh, first of all, Teclo, thank you for, for uh, involving us in this. I think it's a great project. It's, it's a very, uh, I'm very expectant to see where this goes. Uh, everyone had great comments, uh, great ideas. I think they're going to they're gonna further develop. I think this is a great opportunity for the city and for the investor as well. So I'm looking forward to this open discussion and hearing back good reports on this. Awesome. I'll clue y'all in. Very good. Anything else? If not, do I hear a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'd rather meet in person. That's my only comment. I don't like this. You just want food, man. That's what you want. <laughs> no. I got a lunch of sitting over there. So. <laughs> well, hey, let, let me just... Uh, I don't, I don't think the interaction is always better. I, I'm with you. I don't, and, and I just want to say, I don't say this enough. Uh, Y'all do this on a volunteer basis. Thank you very much for for doing this work. Uh, I, I I really appreciate it. And uh, and stay healthy. Uh, you. Be careful. We want to see you back next month. Thank you. Very good. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I move. 
Mr. Dickey, second. 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 Julian, <laughs> Julian. Yeah. Okay. okay, discussion, none. Not the meeting's adjourned. Thank you.